Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the session on legal approaches to ecosystem restoration. Um, there's 73 of us at the moment and it's going up. Um, as many of you know, um, we had the biodiversity strategy in May 2020 and one of the promises was having a restoration law and that's the focus of today's discussion. Um, I'll be your moderator. I'm Patrick Temrink of the European Environmental Bureau, an NGO representing 160 NGOs in Europe. Um, and today we'll have, um, just to give you a uh, look at the agenda. We'll have Stefan Leiner uh, from TG Environment, who's responsible for developing the law. Uh, we'll present um, a little bit the context. We'll have um, Anna Heslop um, from Client Earth presenting an NGO vision as to what the law should be. And then we'll also have a, a panel comprising Villa Nisto, um, um, an MEP, Joana Balsamao, um, presenting the local the local position in Cascais in Portugal, and Henrik Schukens presenting the sort of an academic perspective of what's needed. So we'll explore uh, in several rounds questions with them as to what they think the restoration law should focus on. And there's different options, and we just want to have a debate as to the pros and cons are different. Different ones throughout, we will have at, um, one or two polls, um, and we'll also, there's also a uh, a, sec a section here on the on the page where you can add questions, so you can submit questions, and depending on time, we'll 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 pick up um, several of them. We've got about an hour, so I should probably um, move on straight away. But also to thank, there's a number of people behind the scenes, and also on our side, just a big thanks to Laura and Sergey who have done a lot, and there's there's a wider um, a Green Week team as well of Estelle and others who are doing a lot. So I'll then now like to hand over to um, Stefan Leiner. Um, he's the head of the Biodiversity Unit DG Environment of the Commission, and he's amongst those in charge of developing the Commission proposal on the legal, uh, legally binding restoration targets. Um, and the focus of today very much is on the legally binding restoration targets. There's a lot of other things to talk about, like funding, governance, etc., but we want to stay focused on that one issue. So I'll then hand over uh, to Stefan. Thank you very much, Patrick, and hello uh, to everybody. Good morning. Welcome to this session of the Green Week, which is uh, dealing uh, with uh, an important element of the new biodiversity strategy that the Commission published in May this year. And as you know, it has four main elements. It's enlarging our areas of, uh, that are protected. Um, it is about creating the enabling environment for transformational change. It is demonstrating how we uh, lead or we want to demonstrate that we are ready to lead by examples towards the negotiation of a global uh, biodiversity framework internationally. And at the central and at the heart of the new biodiversity strategy is the EU restoration plan, which has a number of very measurable concrete restoration uh, commitments. However, um, there is also um, announced, as you said, in the strategy that the Commission will publish in uh, 21 or pro make a proposal for legally binding restoration targets. Now, um, the, uh, the, the question that uh, might be asked is why has the Commission made this uh, announcement? Well, first of all, um, we, despite all the legislation we have, despite all the implementation that has happened, we see that biodiversity and ecosystems continue to degrade also in the EU. And uh, this is underpinned by many studies. There was the IPBES report, the global assessment. Uh, there was also uh, at this Green Week, actually, uh, two reports that were published, the State of Nature report and the first EU-wide assessment for ecosystems all paint a rather bleak picture about the state of our uh, ecosystem. So we need to do more. Um, moreover, what we have had so far, um, implementation has been insufficient. Um, there has been, for example, been already a restoration target in the past EU biodiversity strategy, uh, where it says we should restore 15% of our degraded ecosystems. But then when you look at what happened in the follow-up to these targets, there were only very few member states that really developed a thorough process of developing a national restoration plan. I would name Finland that really had a very thorough process in identifying what they want to prioritize in their restoration. Some member states focus on some very specific habitats like in Germany where there was a focus on peatland restoration. But overall, we have seen very little uh, 
done in the actual restoration work. There has been a lot of individual projects, a lot of them were live projects, there has been a lot in restoring some areas of Natural 2000, but then uh, the activities that were happening that were destroying biodiversity and ecosystem overtook, in fact, the effects of these small restoration successes we have done. So, in short, we need to do more and we also need to do more when it comes to restoration targets. The other um, aspect uh, why we have uh, announced this proposal is that there are also some gaps in our current legal system. The Water Framework Directive, we have the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, all of these obviously have a lot of restoration elements embedded in them. However, there are also some gaps. First of all, uh, when you look at the Birds and Habitats Directive, there is no clear deadline uh, when certain part of the habitats and species have to be restored and how much has to be restored by that deadline. Uh, same with other pieces of legislation. And there are also some regulatory gaps when you look at, for example, pollinators, when you look at uh, those ecosystems that are not covered by uh, those pieces of legislation. So uh, we want really to look into those gaps and we want to uh, make sure that we have a stronger system in the future. Having said that, obviously this should not um, replace our existing legal framework, but really strengthen, complement it and strengthen its implementation so that the new legislation supports the legislation we have, where we just also acknowledge that it is fit for purpose. Obviously, we will do a full impact assessment when we develop this uh, new legal framework, um, and we will uh, do an open public consultation. So there will be a lot of room and time to discuss with uh, our member states, with the stakeholders, with everybody interested in that uh, in that process. There is a lot of ideas around of what uh, restoration targets could be. Obviously, already in the strategy, we say that we want as much as possible have co-benefits with climate mitigation and adaptation. So we are looking at some ecosystems that are particularly valuable for uh, storing carbon, for example, like wetlands and peatlands, old growth forests. But we also will look into, for example, some uh, species groups or species or habitats that are particularly important where most restoration efforts is needed or where we can plug some regulatory gaps. But we don't have any firm idea on this yet. We are talking to each other and that's why uh, this uh, Green Week session is so interesting for me personally and for all my team who are developing this new uh, pr commission proposal for legally binding restoration targets uh, because we certainly want to listen to the experts, we want to listen to you and hence I very much uh, look forward to the discussions we are having in the next hour. Thank you. Thank you very much Stefan. I think it was very interesting to, to hear both the context um, and the problems and also the openness for for, for solutions and uh, underlining the issue of policy gaps, um, potential targeting species, potential co-benefits and so on. And as I've understood that, I mean, the, the options are open. There's a, a broad approach which may be looked at, which is encompassing basically good ecosystem condition across the board. And the on the other extreme, or not extreme, but the other side, there's a sort of a much more of a targeted approach focusing on direct impacts uh, in a short period of time on quality of ecosystems. So that will be debated. In terms of questions, do feel free to add them in the question um, uh, box. Um, you'll see that in the top right, but we'll only answer them or ask them to, to Stefan and the other speakers later so that we actually get through in all of this time. So now I'd like to, one, I'd like to hand over to um, Anna Hislop, she's from a lawyer from Client Earth, um, and she's presenting um, the civil society position. So, uh, Client Earth, ourselves, WWF, BirdLife, Fern, uh, um, have, have developed a, a vision as to what we think should be done, and it's also can be it's it's an open vision, and other NGOs and civil society can can sign up to it. But without further ado, I'll hand over to to Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. So as Patrick says, we've been working with a number of NGOs uh, to try to sort of put together what we think 
um, a sort of a strong restoration uh, law can could look like. So I'm just going to kind of give an overview of what we have in mind today and then some of the sort of challenges that we see in that. And um, so I think I think we're quite clear that this needs to be targeted. There is an urgent problem here. Um, we do not have time to waste. Uh, the biodiversity crisis is extremely pressing. And so we need to make sure that we don't end up in a place where, as Stefan said, we've had these commitments before and nothing happens because uh, other sort of uh, interests overrule them. Um, so we need concrete actions. We want to be aiming towards having high quality nature out of this. Um, so we're not just sort of doing little bits of tinkering around the edges of, of the, the low hanging fruit, as it were, you know, protect, uh, improving sites that were already in a sort of fairly decent condition, but that we end up with really high quality um, outputs at the end of it. And I think it's it's one of the things that, that I would just sort of challenge Stefan on a little bit is that we really feel it has to be additional. So plugging gaps in the existing regulation probably isn't enough. There has to be something additional to the obligations that already exist under the Birds and Habitats Directive and the Water Framework Directive. Um, and we can talk a little bit later about why uh, it's, it's, it's very clear to us from the NGO side that simply sort of adding a deadline to existing obligations is not going to be okay. And I personally would argue that some of those obligations are already biting and if you put a deadline you're actually extending the time period for, for member states to achieve some of those. So we need to make sure that we don't undermine the existing legislation, we need to make sure that we don't duplicate anything that's in the existing uh, legislation and we need to make sure that we're not just simply adding a deadline which gives a delay for, for member states to reach those, um, those legally binding targets that they already have. Um, and then, of course, the piece about synergies between biodiversity and climate agenda is extremely important. So some of those habitats, which are our most precious habitats, are also incredibly important for climate change, adaptation and mitigation. So things like peatlands, wetlands, uh, floodplains, coastal areas, upland forests, old growth forests. These can all be really, really important habitats for both nature and climate change. But it's not only those. We also want to make sure that some of our most important natural habitats that don't have any particular sort of climate benefit or, or particular additional climate benefit are still um, kind of restored through this process. In terms of the targets, um, the NGOs uh, that we have been speaking to have in mind a sort of quantitative target. So that 15% we have translated into 650,000 square kilometres of land and 100,000 square kilometres of sea. We think the 15% needs to apply to every member state. Um, and we think 15% of free flowing rivers uh, uh, is another target there. Um, and we're sort of mooting an additional CO2 um, target on top of that so that you try to capture a certain amount or, or store a certain amount of CO2 on top of that. The other thing that's really, really key is that this leads to permanent change. So we don't end up in a situation where member states do some work to restore sites, but um, they end up being destroyed because a motorway comes along or another pressure comes along or in three years time when the funding runs out, we just stop managing the site. Um, we want to make sure that these are resilient, that they have proper management in place and that there's some sort of protection probably at the national uh, level. There's also a question about whether restoration should be done inside or outside Natura sites. And this is, I think, where it, the sort of interesting question about the additionality comes in. So from our point of view, there are certain obligations that already exist within the Birds and Habitats Directive that require member states to properly manage Natura sites, to put in place proper conservation measures and to avoid deterioration on those sites. Doing restoration which would otherwise be required by those articles of the Habitats Directive, we don't think should count towards the 15% here. But you might be doing some restoration which isn't for the features of the site that are already there. It's something additional that isn't required by um, your Habitats Directive designation. Then you could count that. So if you're doing a kind of wider landscape, um, you know, restoration of a floodplain and it happens to also in cover a Natura site and it doesn't conflict with the um, features of that site, then we think that that ought to be able to, to count to, towards the 15%.
It's also really important that we have connectivity between sites. So one of the things that has been kind of lost in, in the sort of existing protected areas network is that we have a lot of sort of islands of protected areas without a sort of connectivity between them. And that's that's something really important. And so if these restoration uh, um, efforts can help to improve that connectivity, that would be a really great bonus. Um, and we think that they could they can encompass passive and active measures. So on some sites, it will be necessary to leave things alone and let nature um, thrive. And on other sites, it will be necessary to intervene a little bit to help nature to do certain management. Management's gonna be a really, really important part of this because we know it's something that's already kind of um, a missing piece in some of our, some of our sort of uh, protections and our, our restoration and management of sites already. Um, so what we have in mind is that we would have a piece of legislation which requires member states to put in place a restoration plan, um, that those plans will be assessed by the European Commission, that there will be a transparent process with public participation so that members of the public, NGOs, civil society groups can comment on those plans, can be involved in that process, and that there are clear deadlines for putting in those plans in place and for um, putting in place the measures that are envisaged in those plans. We don't expect that all of these sites are going to get to perfect you know, status by the, by the sort of the deadline of 2030, but if they have proper management in place and we have proper plans in place which are funded, which are backed up, which are being uh, undertaken, then that will take us in the right direction. Um, there are a couple of sort of difficult questions around this. One is how do you make it additional? So it needs to be clear that it's more than just the existing obligations that we have and more than just putting a deadline on the existing obligations that we have, that we're actually restoring a wider landscape. Um, making it fast. So we don't have a lot of time to waste here. And we've had quite a, a sort of strong debate <laughs> um, in, in amongst even with the NGOs about what the sort of legal form of this should be. Should we try to go for something which is, you know, very quick, um, but sort of does a quick and dirty job? Or do you want to go for a sort of longer term piece of legislation that, that sets us up for a, a kind of a, a longer, potentially a longer um, implementation period, but potentially also a kind of longer term outcome. So that's a little bit of a, a kind of a, a contentious topic and it's, it's an interesting debate about how we manage to get that effectiveness but get it quickly. Um, and then there's also the question of making it stick. Um, these will not all end up being new Natura 2000 sites where this restoration is carried out, but we would want to see some sort of protection, um, perhaps at national level, um, or some sort of incentive to not uh, destroy these sites or fail to manage them after you've hit your target. So that's just a kind of brief overview of where we're at. Um, I hope that sets the scene uh, for the discussion and I'll hand back to Patrick. Much, Anna. I think that was uh, really good and I hope that um, there's a, a number of thoughts that are useful for, for Stefan's reflection. I liked your points on, you know, additionality, not just plugging the gaps, the underlining the need for specific targets. Um, aiming on connectivity to make sure we don't have islands and of course the wider issue participation in the plans and ultimately about effectiveness because that's what it's all about. So and now we'll go to the panel. We have three panelists. Um, we have Vilani Stur, um from Finland, Joana Balsamal from the Kakais Town Hall in Portugal and Henrik Schukens. I hope that Vile Nistur is already here. He was, he was giving a presentation in the plenary in the parliament. So Vile, if you're here, Please speak, I'll count to 15 seconds, otherwise we'll go with Joanna. Um, yes, she's here, okay. So then, so I'll introduce Vilanis too, he's a, an MEP in the Greens, he's the, he's a, the Shadow Rapporteur in the European Parliament reports and he used biodiversity strategy in 2030, and he was also uh, the Minister of the Environment in Finland from 2011 and to 2020, uh, 2014. So, um, ah, he's not here then, is he? Vila, you here or not? Okay, so let's then, in which case we'll um, have a bit of adaptive management. So I'd like to hand over to Joana Balsamao, the, the Councillor for the Environment and Sustainable Development Energy and Planning and Public Participation in Cascais Town Hall, Portugal. Um, 
restoration will happen. It will be very local issues. So I very much like to hear from the local position. And of course, as people know, Portugal will be next year's presidency of the EU. So I'd like to hand over to, to, um, to Joana, please. Hello. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, so this is a wonderful topic and then you've put forth uh, very interesting questions. I'll, I'll, I'll just start by providing our view as a local government. Um, not such a big uh, territory, 97 square kilometers, 200,000 people. A third of our council is uh, a nature reserve and we sit on the coastline. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot to protect and a lot to enhance, many creeks and rivers also flowing north to south. Um, abandoned and, and sort of forgotten. Um, the national, the nature reserve is Natura 2000. It's managed by central state. Uh, however, a huge percentage is owned by private landowners. And the percentage that isn't owned uh, privately is public, but there is not always uh, enough investment. Um, the council has sort of um, in strong liaison with the government, we've sort of taken over this task. So we're now managing the public uh, areas of the nature reserve. And we've started a new, strange new partnership with the private landowners. Uh, strange because in Portugal, this is not so common to work public and private for restoration and conservation. And normally this kind of partnership doesn't happen. But um, it's a huge area and it's been abandoned. It's quite uniform uh, vegetation wise, totally prone to forest fires because of all the invasive species and, and all that uh, comes with that. Um, and, and we looked back at what the charts uh, from 80, 100 years ago showed us. And the maps were actually really interesting. They showed like a mantelpiece. Uh, scenario where each parcel of land had a different function, be it for agriculture, uh, beehives, forestry, um, pasture, you name it. They were all different and they were all uh, sort of scattered and, and this kind of discontinuity provided for not only an income but also for better biodiversity, much stronger resilience to forest fires. Um, and now we're working with uh, the government and uh, academia and the local landowners to restore biodiversity and restore some kind of economic dynamics to this place. Um, we're also starting with creek restoration. It's, it's truly complex from an administrative point of view, but really interesting. Again, here, not Natura 2000 area. Um, and we're also working hard with academia and NGO to restore seabeds. Now, we used to have many um, different types of uh, seagrass growing and they've gone. Uh, and so now we're uh, working with uh, universities to understand which algae species would grow back better uh, without compromising the ecosystem and which algae species um, uh, and how to plant them more effectively. Uh, this is already progressing in a very interesting way. Uh, and, and this would be a win-win-win situation, of course. It would bring back the seagrass, uh, bring back fish, capture carbon, um, and provide more oxygen. So, yes, I'm very much looking forward to this. I, in Kashkaj, I'm lucky to say that biodiversity is really not the poor element of environmental policies, but this does happen elsewhere. It does happen um, at national level as well. Um, you mentioned <clears throat> the importance of um, connecting the targets and, and possibly afterwards even the funding to other co-benefits like mitigation and adaptation and I think I think this is a brilliant idea. I think it's it's also a way of bringing all these issues closer to people. Uh, we we have um, it's easier to communicate uh, climate change adaptation um, to residents when 
we de demonstrate that there's other co-benefits for them. For example, in creek restoration, because this means nature-based solutions and new walk, walking paths and cycling tracks beside the river and just new outdoors areas that people can use, this is much easier to explain and instead of saying, well, look, this, this is a nature-based solution that will mitigate uh, the risk of floods, for example. Um, also, you mentioned connectivity and yes, our neighboring uh, municipalities, we share the same rivers, the same creeks, we even share the same uh, nature reserve. So at the end of the day, um, whatever stimulus comes from uh, Brussels to um, enhance connectivity with neighboring territories is extremely welcome because normally, unfortunately, uh, I have to admit that we focus very strongly on the effort of you know, carrying out our own mission um, and then the whole connectivity issue with neighboring uh, municipalities might be forgotten. Um, another co-benefit that I think should be enhanced in future legislation would be the social and economic one, especially in post-COVID, uh, well, yeah, post-COVID or whatever, we're still in COVID, but uh, when, when recovering from the COVID uh, effect on the economy and on the social dimension, uh, it's really important to demonstrate that um, um, green economy can actually be a wonderful uh, lever. And uh, so, so if, if by restoring biodiversity, we also demonstrate that this has important economic and social impacts, um, this is again a win-win situation. Um, I would also emphasize another point that I don't think was mentioned yet, which is uh, public engagement, public participation, it would be really impossible to do, uh, to conduct any of the three examples that I mentioned without involving stakeholders, be they the landowners, be they just other citizens that need to understand what's happening. And it's a great opportunity for, for just explaining and conveying knowledge about the importance of, of the ecosystem services. Um, you also mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning the the role of cities or municipalities, and I would just like to end with that note. Um, I realize that some changes are being made to, for example, regional funding, etc. But I don't think that enough uh, relevance has been given to the role of the local governments. And uh, when you think that it's locally sometimes that you get the most proximity to people and the most agility with processes at the local level we are not as ridden by ideology or bureaucracy as the central state is there's also a role for central states naturally always um, but um, I, I believe that cities or local governments should be um, uh, their role should be better enhanced in whatever comes next Ah, one last note I, I, I forgot to mention, enforcement. Enforcement is so difficult, especially if we're creating new restoration areas that are not protected, uh, Natura 2000 or any other instrument. Uh, we've had many problems in our local marine protected area. It's the first municipal one in Portugal. Uh, we've had people coming over literally just uh, stealing uh, taking away, ravaging uh, the intertidal uh, biodiversity for purposes we don't yet understand. The maritime police does not arrive on time. And uh, and this is a very strong onus for um, us to not only um, create, implement, uh, restore, and then enforce and monitor. Um, and so I would also, just before uh, passing over the floor, I would like to share this um, this challenge. It's it's sort of it's ongoing. Enforcement is is difficult. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joanna, for the perspective of, of Kashkaish. And it's good that you underlined the wider issue of um, 
the ownership patchwork, um, the, also the practical collaboration that you've had um, with both NGOs and academia, uh, and also underlining the issues of co-benefits and enforcement. And just to build on the um, collaborations with academia, I'll like make a bridge to our next speaker. So this is Hendrik Schukens. He's the um, uh, works in the he's a postdoctoral assistant department of European Public and International Law at Ghent University. Um, yes, and he's also a lawyer at the Brussels Bar. So I'll hand over to to Henrik, and then afterwards Vilo hopefully will have been able to join us from the plenary. So over to you, Henrik. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Um... So good morning. Um, as a starting point, I, I, I think I want to underline the importance of uh, shifting our ecological governments also to the, the principle of uh, eco-restoration. I think it, it is indeed vital not only to halt the biodiversity loss, but it will also be an, a crucial component of uh, comprehensive climate change policy, um, given the major importance of carbon, carbon sinks in the CO2 cycle. So it is beyond dispute that eco-restoration needs to be put at the heart of our uh, legal system. That said, it's also important to underline both the potentialities as well as the limits of the law. Uh, in its most basic conception, the law or law in, as a concept is defined as a set of rules created and enforced through social and governmental institutions and aimed at regulating behavior. And EU law has some very interesting uh, principles which turn it into, can turn it into a very effective instrument. It, it has a direct effect, it supersedes national law, it can be enforced uh, through uh, the European Commission's via in infringement procedures. So EU law has some potentialities in terms of putting eco-restoration uh, forward as a very, uh, at the forefront of our ecological governance uh, in the European Union. Yet at the same time, several caveats are to be um, reiterated. First of all, uh, legal systems tend to focus on, on or are, are, are often uh, very static and rigid. They are aimed at creating legal certainty. And we have to acknowledge that ecological restoration as a concept is, uh, will um, have to interact with dynamism. Uh, it is aimed at ecosystems, and ecosystems are dynamic. So many variables will be at play. This will be a challenge when you approach it from a, from a, a traditional legal perspective. And often, and, and a second point is also that um, the law is, has a tendency to focus or to create what I call cold situations, where the actors are identified, the interests are stabilized, and the responsibilities are acknowledged. And this is done through creating contracts, uh, permit systems, and so on and so forth. But with ecological restoration, of course, everything is controversial. We have to assess and determine its scope. We have to define it. We have to identify the actors at play. There are many variables, such as climate change, which might also, which might also impact the, the targets you're setting in terms of eco-restoration. So, and against this backdrop, I would advocate for both a pragmatic and an ambition, ambitious approach. We have to be pragmatic, and I think it's important to underline that the existing EU legislation and in particular the Habitats Directive can uh, serve as a major lever for targeted uh, uh, eco-restoration efforts. There is a lot of hidden potential inside the Habitats Directive which can be enforced both by the European Commission, both by uh, targeted strategic litigation at the national level, both by interest groups and by politicians. So there is a lot of hidden potential. Uh, the favorable conservation status is, is um, um, has not been reached. So a lot can be done there. And the Habitats Directive is being enforced and also reinterpreted by the European Court of Justice as an instrument which can be used to restore certain endangered habitats and species. And this might be the focus for the coming years. But complementing this pragmatic approach, we should also aim at a more overarching uh, legal instrument. And this could be uh, could take the form of an EU environmental directive. And if we aim for an EU environmental directive in terms of eco-restoration, uh, 
I think uh, we need to um, take into account certain concepts and issues uh, that need to be defined in this context. First of all, the concept of eco-restoration, we need to come forward with a clear definition. If we want to monitor eco-restoration, we, we need to take into account both active and passive restoration efforts. We need to acknowledge whether it is whether we should aim at a final destination or whether, as the European Commission acknowledges, acknowledges it already, it is more uh, to be approached as a process. We need benchmarks and we need flexible targets, which are both binding, but at the same time also, also realistic. It is uh, not feasible to recreate old uh, growth forest in, in a period of mere, uh, a mere 10 years. It's also not possible to create a major Serengeti-like landscape in Europe. But at the same time, we can do a lot even in the context of urban ecosystems. We also need clear mandates, legal mandates in, in, in a, a legal instrument which go beyond mere offsetting. And this is a question that was already raised by one of the participants. Of course, offsetting is a vital instrument in terms of avoiding net losses, but we should go beyond that and we should also go beyond our existing protected sites. Uh, and again, uh, this can be let down in, an, in a new legal instrument, but at the same time, it can also be uh, part of uh, enforcing the existing commitments under the EU Habitats Directive. Uh, we also need to bring for, make sure that this, the scope of the EU restoration mandates are um, integrating other sectoral domains such as the uh, common agricultural policy, the common fishery policy, and also spatial planning legislation. Eco-restoration should be one of the major objectives to be considered when member states uh, put forward new planning processes. And last but not least, we should also uh, take a look at enforcement. I think um, the RS Convention uh, offers ample opportunity for uh, NGOs to enforce uh, already existing commitments, but enforcement should also be placed at the forefront of new legislation in this regard. And as a final uh, take-home uh, message, I would also underline the importance of property. Property is vital in order, to, if we want to envisage large-scale restoration, we will need to acquire and purchase lands at, at, at some point, or we will need to collaborate with private landowners. And property is a major is, issue to be determined here. There is not a lot of EU legislation uh, focusing on the topic of property. It is often being approached as a, as a national, a part of national law, national legal traditions. Yet restoration should also, and this is per, probably a more philosophical of or theoretical um, ID, but it, it should also be integrated in a, a new uh, 21st century approach to the concept of property, which is not all, only focusing on existing generations, but also takes into account our future uh, commitments towards uh, the, the following, uh, the next generation. So these are my main uh, comments uh, in this respect. Thank you very much. I think that uh, reminds us why we need lawyers in this world, because um, we have a, to have a law, it needs to be legally binding, and there's a lot of different aspects to focus on, the controversial issues, and link, also links to planning, links to Aarhus, various different levers. But I, liked, I very much liked the idea of, um, of thinking of property also in the wider sense of, of future property and future ownership, that broadens the concept, um, which is interesting to see coming from, from a legal perspective. So thanks you for that. And good news is that um, Villa Nistu uh, has managed to join us from the Prenu from the Parliament. Uh, as introduced before, he's in the Greens EFAs, the, the Finnish Shadow Rapporteur of the EP reports on the EU's biodiversity strategy. Um, so, without greater ado, I, let, I'll hand over to Villa. Villa, thank you. Thank you very much and, and good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to join and, and I'm obviously sorry I missed the previous uh, commentators because of, of, of my speech on energy union, but, but obviously uh, we are trying to promote also a more sustainable energy policy in the European Union in order to also to protect biodiversity, make sure that energy policies and biodiversity protection are in line. There's a lot to be done there as well. But on, on today's topic, I think uh, if you look at it from a decision maker's viewpoint, I think it's clear that we will need a uh, proper focus on restoration of, of ecosystems in order to make sure that we hold the loss of biodiversity both within the European Union and globally. Uh, having worked as a, a Minister of Environment in Finland, I have followed the Finnish uh, discussion on, on nature conservation for, for already decades. 
And we've had some progresses when it comes to protected areas, increasing connectivity of the protected areas, but there's a lot of uh, links missing still uh, making the habitat strong enough to, for species to survive and, and hold the loss of biodiversity. Obviously, a lot of things needs, needs to be done also in how we uh, use uh, agricultural land and forest in, in, uh, in our economy, uh, that, that we make sure that outside protected areas, uh, the way we use land is more sustainable for biodiversity and species. But restoration is a key part of this. Because, for example, when it comes to the birds, uh, the bird uh, uh, coastal areas have been uh, quite uh, badly degraded, and now in Finland, the current government has spent uh, is spending hundred uh, uh, million euros annually for a program that will help in re restoring these lands and and making sure that the bird habitats are in in, in better shape. And this means that we will need money for uh, a restoration. Uh, uh, focus in, within the European Union, and we will need a legislative framework in order to channel that money into it. Politicians don't understand the value of nature protection if there is no legal framework uh, and obligation to, to support it. So my message is clear. I think there needs to be a European-wide uh, restoration target, and it needs to be legally binding. Then the European Commission has tools to make sure that member states actually apply this. There may be uh, a range of uh, tools how to how to approach it it may be done with a, a legal legal uh, program or it may be done with subsidies but it has to be a uh, target has to be uh, uh, legally binding in order to make sure that all countries take part of this and i think the kind of like the key message from researchers whom I've been working with in the past uh, decades is that, that obviously we will need both. We will need uh, better protected areas, more connectivity between better protected areas, increasing number of, of protection globally and within Europe. And I think the, the goal of getting 30% into that is, is something which is uh, a realistic minimum from the viewpoint of biodiversity protection. Uh, and it has to be also politically uh, achievable. So uh, as the biodiversity strategy lays this out, it's a tool for us also to push for it in, in the Kunming meeting in, in the COP uh, for, for a global protection target as well. But in addition to that, we know that especially globally and in some parts of Europe, maybe not at, at all parts, but, but in many parts, uh, restoration needs to go in hand in hand to make sure that that, that uh, core protected areas network is supported by a, a proper restoration program that makes sure the species can survive. And I think uh, an aspect which I would like to say coming from a forested country is, is that the, there are a lot of actions that are interlinked and in, in kind of like in between these targets. And one is uh, proforestation. Since we already know that uh, in a country like Finland that has a lot of forests, but in southern Finland, uh, the southern half of the country, if I put it in an uh, understandable fashion, the southern part of the country has only about, uh, the forest cover is still large, but only about 4% of that amount is old forests. So obviously we have to protect it, these old forests, but in addition, in addition to that, we will need also proforestation to create old forests and, and to create better uh, surroundings for species outside that area to make sure that the, the, the ecological corridors are in, in, in shape and, and that we have a protection network that will sustain and, and, uh, and increase biodiversity and, and, and not decrease it. So these are all the different aspects we should take into account. And, and finally, I would like to also take up the issue of farmlands. Obviously, this week, uh, the European Parliament uh, makes its decision on the reform of CAP. This is uh, going to be a small progress towards the right, uh, right direction when it comes to the eco schemes. But as a green politician, I'm, I'm very disappointed by the lack of ambition from the majority uh, uh, part parties in the, in the Parliament, since the majority is now proposing two small changes in order to make sure that biodiversity is, is streamlined into the agricultural policy. But we are still getting some progress and it's clear that we have to push for this very actively in, in the public agenda because farmlands and, and the monoculture the way of, of how we use farmlands are one of the key reasons for, for loss of habitat and loss of species within Europe and agricultural policy that would be better in line with, with, uh, with uh, 
a protection of biodiversity could still increase crops or at least keep the crop productivity at a, at a high rate and still increase biodiversity. So we will need uh, like uh, winter vegetation, we will need uh, bio, uh, biodiversity pro focused programs into agricultural subsidy schemes. And if there is no subsidies for these eco schemes that are, are intact in its core, then we don't have the tools and the money to implement this change and restoration obviously of for example former peatlands is a key and we lost a, a vote there also in the parliament that i think uh, turning uh, unproductive agricultural peatlands back into uh, uh, bio, bio, biodiversity rich uh, peatlands is one very good way of addressing both co2 emissions and, and biodiversity loss so these tools need to be put in, in place and restoration target a binding one will help us in the that regard even though we don't get the uh, subsidy schemes won't be perfect probably after this reform we will still need binding targets for these kind of restoration goals also when it comes to the agricultural land thank you Okay, no, thank you very, very much for the, for the, for that, Vili. I think it was very helpful for you to both, at one level, show the the globe, the context, and the and the, to the global context of uh, Kunming and the CBD, but also the links to forestry and farming, and especially especially to the cap, because that's been going through a very rough ride in the in the Parliament this week, and underlining that it's essential to have eco schemes there to be able to have a tool to make it to make it work. So we've now had um, very rich presentations from across the panel. We've got 15 minutes left. So we had five or six questions for everyone, but I'll put them in my pocket because it's good to uh, listen to the questions or answer the questions from, from the public. We're now 137 of us. So maybe the first question um, is, does the commission have plans to support community-led restoration initiatives through capacity building and funding? Um, now that one's obviously for you, Stefan. And then Thank you, um, and thank you for everybody for really enriching comments to this uh, debate and for the questions as well. Well, um, the Commission already does, but it does not do it directly. It's uh, supporting member states and local authorities through its various instruments, the live funding instruments, the regional funds, the uh, common agricultural policy funds can be used also in rural areas. So there is uh, the fisheries fund for the coastal and fisheries communities. Uh, so the, it, it will certainly continue to do that. And uh, I think that's also the moment to reiterate that these legally binding restoration targets are uh, not replacing all the rest that is in the biodiversity strategy that really addresses a number of those issues that are also mentioned in the questions um, with our EU restoration plans, with working uh, with local authorities, with working in agricultural, in forest areas, etc. So uh, yes, we, we have the plans to do it, we already do it, and we certainly, with the implementation of the biodiversity strategy, intend to do it even more. But at the end, it will depend on the member states to use the funding instruments the Commission has uh, in order to prioritize those in, in their national uh, and local programming uh, problems. Thank you very much. And I've got another question here. Um, and it's, uh, do you think that rewilding approach can be integrated in EU law? Um, and hence, uh, if channeled through the ecological restoration rationale? So a question on rewilding. I don't know who wishes to answer that one. Uh, maybe um, it's obviously one that could fit for you, Stefan, but maybe a legal approach as well. I'm happy to, to, to say, to, to answer this. Um, well, rewilding is certainly one of the restoration tools that we are having. Uh, and in theory, it could be. Uh, however, the question is, what do we want to address with this law? Do we want to address what is the target that has to be achieved and by when? And uh, what are the instruments we put in place in order to do that? Like the uh, restoration plans that the member states need to do, uh, what funding instruments we, we will make available, all these aspects rather than uh, describing to the member states what are the tools that there are to be used in order to achieve those. And I think we are in an area where we probably uh, will, will leave it more to the member states on what the tools uh, they will be using in order to achieve the re those restoration targets, because the situation 
is so uh, different from uh, or an already rather wild area and areas which which where still a lot of rewilding needs to be done thank you very much i've now got a question which looks like it's probably for anna um and it's a bit of a controversial question so the question is should we not focus on existing mechanisms e.g the habitats directives and advance implementation instead of adding new ideas so um, focusing on existing commitments would avoid redundancies and promote efficiency regarding natural personal administrative resources so should we simply do better with what we've got uh, and not go ahead so that's a nice controversial question so maybe Anna you'd like to yeah, I actually don't think that is too controversial, Patrick. I think the answer is that we have to do both. Um, I think we do need better enforcement of the Habitats Directive um, and the Birds Directive uh, and the Water Framework Directive and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. I think it's very clear that we have some really strong laws there that are not currently being implemented as well as they could be. Um, I personally, I, I think, I think it's probably what what Henrik was was hinting at as well. I think that there are parts of the Habitats Directive that are stronger than we think they are, and that there is still new law to be kind of um, made, uh, case law to be made on the Habitats Directive. I think there's a lot more that we can do around, um, uh, you know, the obligations not to allow deterioration and and the obligations around management. So, um, I think I think we have to do better at enforcing the directives we have. But I think there's also uh, there is space to acknowledge that the Habitats and Birds Directive do have some gaps. I mean, when they were negotiated, that was a, in itself a political compromise. And I think whilst none of us want to reopen it, um, and we all we all very sort of keen to keep the Habitats Directive as it is, that there is an acknowledgement that there are some some habitats or some species that are not covered by the Habitats Directive, and it's particularly not um, particularly helpful at at doing that sort of wider landscape scale um, restoration and management and that connectivity piece. The Habitats Directive is a little bit weaker on that. So I think there's a place for both uh, both things, better enforcement and something new and additional. Thanks very much. No, I fully agree with that. I'm sure most people do. Um, okay, so we have 10 minutes left and the clock's counting. We need to leave space at the end for Stefan, but we have uh, one question now um, for both Phil and Hendrik, and then I've got a question then for for um, um, uh, for Joanna. So the question for for um, is basically for for Hendrik and and uh, Vile is is let me sorry I've lost it now that's why I'm stalling. Um, yes, to focus more on existing commitments. So building on what Anna has just said, would you like to say a little bit more on on what we can do more on existing commitments and complementing them? But keep to one minute each because I'd like to have time for uh, for Joanne as well. So I don't know maybe Vila first and then Henrik. Okay, thanks. I, I also uh, again. Uh, Take it from my experience as as, as a politician. I think the politicians uh, have a more uh, pressure to actually deliver results when we have uh, the, a group of targets and group of uh, binding legislation that uh, covers the, the whole topic in in a proper way. And uh, that's why uh, the habitats uh, directive or, or the birds uh, they are maybe I would say specific specific on on the topic, but not specific on the aerial protection. So when we have the, both the restoration targets and then the protected uh, areas targets, and then the more specific protection programs and, and directives, then we can actually make sure that the, the, the politicians deliver and it, there are no gaps between these. So I think it's kind of like an architectural protection where restoration can take the ecosystem-wide approach better into, into legislation. And I, I think it will increase enforceability as well. It's easier to see if it's not uh, achieved that then we demand change from the commission side. So it's a tool for the commission actually to demand the member states to deliver. There are some problems in, in devil relevance and, and implementation of the current directives due to not having these kind of broader ecosystem-based uh, approaches in the, in the binding legislation. No, thanks very much for that. And Hendrik, do you want to add to that? I think I can uh, echo what has already been stated. I just merely wanted to point out that uh, the existing Habitat Directive is in, in the Netherlands uh, already used in order to uh, advocate for large-scale restoration in view of the excessive uh, amount of nitrogen deposition which has uh, been uh, put into ecosystems. 
Uh, the Habitats Directive is also already being used in existing case laws and as an argument to create uh, restoration zones for, amongst others, uh, farmland species. And I think it is crucial in order for the coming years because a, a new legal instrument, if, if we want a comp comprehensive legal instrument, it will have to take the form of an EU environmental directive. You, in terms of e a political feasibility, we'll need to see what is possible. So I think we need to be pragmatic, as I mentioned, but also creative and creative with the existing legislation and I think the ecosystem-based approach, we often tend to agree that this is not basically written or was not the, the overarching perspective of the drafters of the uh, Habitat Directive. Yet, uh, I do not fully agree with that. If we look at the Nature's Report, then 80% uh, of our um, natural habitats are in an poor or degraded uh, conservation status, then it's clear that uh, merely focusing also within the context of the Habitat Directive of our uh, existing protected sites will not be sufficient in order to, to reach the overarching uh, objectives of the Habitat Directive. So I think there is a lot of potential which is hidden both in the Habitat Directive, also in the, in the Water Framework Directive, which could be used to good effects in order to, to bridge the gap uh, and, and, and the time frame uh, which we still, we will ha have to wait for several years in order for a new legal instrument to be put in place and uh, even more years in order to be, for it to be enforced. So we need to be creative with the existing instruments we have in order to, to put restoration back to the forefront. Thank you very much. That's uh, super clear. Um, right. Um, to you, Joana, a question because Portugal is taking over the presidency from Germany. It's, it's the middle of the German, Portuguese and Slovenian presidency. So do you have any uh, comments as to your hopes as to what Portugal can do to basically promote restoration during your presidency? And then after that, I'll hand over to Stefan. Yes, there are... I have strong hopes. I feel, um, I, 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 as I mentioned before, uh, biodiversity in general all over the world, and Portugal was not an exception, biodiversity has been the poor parent of, of uh, environmental policies for, for too long. And I feel that in Portugal, this, uh, this is now starting to shift, um, and in, in a good way. Um, uh, quite recently, uh, for example, uh, hundreds of uh, new um, staff members were hired to, to join the, the National Conservation Institute, for example. So I think this is a good sign. Um, new targets and uh, legally binding targets would be extremely useful. Um, I think they are helpful in two senses, not just for guidance and the in the obvious, obvious sense, uh, but also uh, for it, it, it gives a special backing for stakeholders in general to demand more from their authorities, as we've seen with climate situations, climate change uh, issues, um, and so there's there's more um, public um, demand for the accomplishments or, or the attainments of, of the targets, or even some case laws regarding climate justice. But on the other hand, I think that uh, climate targets, legally binding ones, um, biodiversity binding targets are useful also for the authorities, be they local, regional or national, because it will provide um, a backing that urges action. And you know that sometimes uh, when ministers sit amongst their peers uh, with other ministers and the Minister of Environment says we need to protect biodiversity, um, but there's all sorts of other emergencies or other priorities on the table. Uh, this need protecting biodiversity or restoration of ecosystems might not be considered by the peers as a priority. Uh, if there is a legally binding target, this will provide the backing that he or she needs to really strongly develop uh, more um, more action on the ground. Um, so yes, I have I have very strong hopes for the Portuguese uh, presidency. Uh, I think we will be dealing with all the climate uh, legislation, um, and we have great negotiators. And and I have to interrupt you now, Joana, because I want to give two minutes because there's a there's a, a mechanical cut off at the end. But thank you very much for that. I'm glad that it will go forward. Um, uh, Stefan, for the wrap up, you've got two minutes.
you and thank you to everybody for really inspiring uh, comments. Um, if I may summarize what I took home uh, from those is, uh, First of all, there is an overall support for legally binding restoration targets, uh, not only uh, because restoration is absolutely needed, many of you said it, and uh, that also legally binding targets gives a boost to uh, strengthen already ongoing restoration activities like they're happening uh, in Kashkarish. I think there is a call for urgency. So uh, when I hear directive and you think that these usually take several years to be transposed in national law, I mean, that raises, I think, quite a lot of questions because uh, several of you said we need something that delivers results and delivers results rather sooner than later. The, the date 2030 uh, was mentioned. Um, there was quite some discussion on the relationship with the other existing legislation. Uh, Anna mentioned the need for additionality. But again, I think that raises the question when you see that uh, I think many of you also stress the synergies between climate change. And when you see that I think over 80% of the wetlands or even more than that are actually covered by the annexes of the Habitats Directive, which has an obligation of restoration not only inside the Natural 2000 site, but overall, you, you, that already raises the difficult questions about what is then really additional to already implementing what we have. And several of you have said that already implementing the Birds and Habitats Directives will require a huge restoration effort. Um, I think the question about what does restoration actually mean? Uh, what, how are we going to measure that member states have done what they are to be done? Is it the passive, the active restoration? Is it just having taken the action or do you want to see results? And if yes, what are those results? Uh, the, the, it was mentioned that restoring a natural forest, for example, takes centuries. So this is, I think, an important question to also be, be looked at. Um, I think legal certainty versus um, this fuzzy aspect of ecosystem restoration is another issue that was mentioned that we will really have to grapple with in a way because we need clear definitions it has to be clear what has to be done by when but on the other hand risk ecosystem restoration is a very complex uh, uh, matter so um, that is another point that i took back i think the importance of generating co-benefits not just for climate but also to look very well in the eco, eco social economic assessments that we will need to do in the impact assessment also to demonstrate the economic benefits uh, another point of uh, that was uh, mentioned was enforceability and here again a link with the birds and habitats directive because it was said and i think it's true that if you have a natural 2000 site it's much easier to enforce restoration targets than if you don't have any legal protection on the ground so the link with property the link uh, with, with these issues is very important. And then also um, this relationship between pragmatism and comprehensiveness, where we need to strike a balance between yeah, having some sort of pragmatism on the other hand, but on the other, uh, taking into account that this is a very overarching and comprehensive issues. And the last point, I think, is to really bring the people on board and give them the incentives. So create capacity, uh, provide the financial instruments that are necessary for, for example, a city like Kashkaj to be able to then also uh, implement this law and achieve the, the targets that we will set. So all of that, a lot of food for thought. I, I think that everybody who has listened to this has understood that we have a difficult task ahead of us, but also a very important and a very interesting one. And I look forward to continue these discussions with all of the, uh, the stakeholders we had here today and the others that are listening to our session. Thank you.